Hey, Bridgepoint, whether you are with us online or here in the room, we want to welcome you. My name is Jared. I'm the teaching pastor. If you are brand new with us, if this is your first time, we want to welcome you to the Bridgepoint family. How it is good to be together. Last week was such a great celebration. Thank you to all those who made Easter great, either online or here in person. It was such a sweet celebration of the most important thing to us. That is that Jesus is alive, he is risen, he is king, and we worship him. And it was so good to see new faces and old faces that were back for the first time in a long time. And uh, man, so as we are now in the weeks following Easter, I want to ask the question, what happens after the resurrection? Okay, so for the first disciples, they spent uh, several weeks with Jesus with the risen Jesus, eating, traveling, talking, um, just, just celebrating. And then Jesus went up into heaven. He ascended into heaven. From there, he sent down his Holy Spirit to live with and in those who belong to him. So that meant that they had this personal and powerful experience of the presence of God. And then everything went back to normal, as if nothing ever happened. You think, for those of you that know, the, you know your Bible, you know that that is not how it went down, right? That those people who belonged to Jesus and who had his presence in their lives, they looked to the resurrection, they were radically transformed in every way. There was nothing normal, nothing the same about their lives after the resurrection of Jesus, right? He changed everything. And the same is true for us today, many years later. I believe that there should be a distinctive difference in people who believe in the risen Jesus and who live with his presence in their lives, right? That things should change. There should be a difference in how we relate to each other and how we go about life and and that he should make all the difference. But if we are honest, if you ever feel what I feel, Sometimes you feel the conflict of looking around and wondering if there is anything actually different about your life. I mean, statistics would show that we still deal with the same problems, the same patterns, the same struggles and sins that the rest of the world does. And it feels so frustrating and discouraging to us. And if we step back, we ask the question, why is this the case? Well, this series that we're entering into is going to address exactly that. Okay? We're calling it Cleaning House. And so we're going to use the image of a house to represent your life. So I just want want you to take a minute right where you're at to close your eyes. And if your life was represented by a house, what kind of house would it be? Okay, just dream. You got it? Hold on just a minute. If your life was represented by a house, what kind of house would it be? All right, just tell the person next to you what it would be. You can post it online in the comments. You can share it with someone in your house. Like what would your house be if your house represented your life? You got it? Mine is a cabin in the woods on the side of a mountain that looks down over some beautiful water. Doesn't that sound nice? But more important than what your house looks like on the outside is what condition it is on the inside. And that's really what this series is about. We are going to use this imagery, this analogy, to talk about the different parts of our lives by entering into different rooms of a house. So every room represents a different part of your life. And we're going to enter into many different parts of our lives to ask these two questions. These two questions will define the entire series, okay? So the first is, what does Jesus want here? And what do I need to do with him? What does Jesus want here in this particular room of my house? And what do I need to do, okay? And so the hope is that throughout this series, we would be radically changed by Jesus. Because it is my conviction that people, again, using this image of a house to represent your life, people who let Jesus come in will be changed by him. I believe that. People who let Jesus come in will be changed by him. That is the overarching truth, uh, the point of this whole series. If you let Jesus come in, you will be changed by him. And any change that Jesus brings is always for the good. And so we want to equip you. Um, Our staff has worked pretty hard on these. We're calling this the Cleaning House Workbook. Okay, so it is a very active, engaging uh, resource that will lead you through the weeks of this series. So if you want a sneak peek, you can check it out. Um, this, This will give you guiding questions for each week as we enter into the different rooms to challenge you to ask those two questions. What does Jesus want here in this part of my life? And what do I need to do? In response to that. 
And so if you were here with us, you get a little bit of a head start. On your way out, it says, easy as veering left to stop by the cafe and grabbing one of these off the counter. If you are with us online, then we encourage you just to stop by the building sometime this week. Stop by and pick one up or take a stack and pass them out to your group. Um, if that doesn't work for you, you can let us know and maybe we can figure out a way to get one to you. Okay, but it's really important that you have one of these. It's going to guide us through the real practical work of this series. And again, the hope is that by the end, our lives will be changed by Jesus. So that brings me back to where we are today. Today, we are beginning on the porch. The porch is where people come if they want to enter your home. And so today, the porch represents where you first meet Jesus, and it also represents the most important decision you have to make throughout this whole series. And to be clear, there, there are some among us who have never opened their door, let Jesus in, and so the hope is for you that you would believe that, that it is worth it to share life with Jesus. But this isn't only for people who've never made a decision about Jesus. This is also for all those who have and need to continue to open up their lives more and more to him. Okay, And so before we get into this, before we really stand on the porch and face the decision we have, I want to take a minute to pray. That we believe that the best way to read scripture is to do so after we've taken a moment to prepare our hearts and minds. So I'm going to give you uh, some space right where you are at. I just want you to ask God to clear your mind, help you to focus and hear from him. And then I will pray and we'll keep going. All right, so take a moment just to prepare. God, we push out all the distractions and we breathe in your presence. We know that you are with us here. And so I just pray that you give us ears to hear, to believe, to trust, to obey. God, I pray that you empower my words to be effective according to your good purpose in this moment. Holy Spirit, do your work as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we understand what happens on the porch, I need to back up just a little bit. And this is a truth that that runs through all of Scripture. It's actually maybe the central truth of all of Scripture, and that is that God desires to live with people, okay? God desires to live with people. So if you go back to the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, we were just there in our last series, Genesis 1 and 2, you get a picture in the Garden of Eden of God and people living in perfect harmony, right? If you go to the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation chapters 21 and 22, You get a picture of the glory of heaven, and it's God and people living in perfect harmony. So think about it, beginning and end, God and people in peace together. Everything in between is about God dealing with the sin that distances people from him so that they can be brought back into a relationship with him. So starting in Genesis 3, sin is the problem, and it separates people from God because it buries us in shame and guilt and regret and fear cause us to run from God, even though he is loving and kind. And at the same time, the holy, good, and just God cannot welcome sin into his presence. And so the result is that sin separates God from the people he loves. But God has always intended to draw people back, even imperfect, sinful people, draw them back into life with him. So if you trace the story of the Old Testament, it's really about that. It happens in different ways because sin has not yet been removed. And so God's presence is experienced really only by a few people at certain times in specific places. In order for people to experience the presence of God, they've got to go to the tabernacle or the temple. Uh, They've got to perform uh, rituals that include sacrifices. And it's really only for a very short time that they can enjoy the presence of God. But God promised that someday people would live in his presence, not temporarily, but eternally. And then Jesus shows up. Jesus comes on the scene, and we are told in John chapter 1, verse 14, listen to this. So Old Testament, dwelling place of God, the tabernacle or temple. Here's what it says. John chapter 1, verse 14, the word that's Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So this says two things. One, Jesus is God, all of the glory of God, and When he came in the flesh, he he became the dwelling place of God on earth. 
So his body became the new residence for God on earth. So when people saw Jesus, they saw God. When they experienced his power, it was God's power. When they heard his wisdom, it was God's wisdom. Jesus is and was God, and so he was the presence of God on earth. It's a new era. But even then, the presence of God, life with God, was only limited to the people who could physically interact with Jesus. People in another nation, they they didn't experience the presence of God. They couldn't, couldn't see that and feel it. And so there was still something coming, and Jesus spoke about it in John chapter 14. Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth. We call him the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus says, something's going to happen. I'm going to leave you. But then the Spirit is going to come. And the Spirit will live in those who belong to Jesus. And this is even better than having Jesus beside them. Instead of having Jesus beside them, they're going to have the Holy Spirit in them. This becomes the most personal experience of the presence of God since the Garden of Eden. And it is the closest people can possibly get until the glory of heaven. This is incredible. Life with God through the Holy Spirit. But that only happens because Jesus removes sin so that God can dwell in us. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 22 says this. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling. Did you catch that? The dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So trace this with me for a minute. Old Testament dwelling place of God, tabernacle and temple. New Testament dwelling place of God, the body of Jesus. Present dwelling place of God, people who belong to Jesus. Are you with me? We are the dwelling place of God, the experience of his presence on earth. If we believe in Jesus, we've been washed clean by him and filled by his spirit. Absolutely incredible. And so what I want you to understand is that if your, if your life is represented by a house, I want you to understand that Jesus wants to live there, okay? All of scripture speaks to that truth. Jesus wants to dwell in and with you. But here's the thing. The forgiveness of sin, the filling of the spirit, those are gifts that are only received by people who accept them who choose to receive them. So if someone says, I don't want that, then God does not force that upon them. He gives you the the ability to be able to say, yes, I want life with Jesus, or no, I do not. Which brings us back to the porch. That Jesus is standing on the porch. He is knocking at your door. He is pursuing you. He loves you. He's working in your life so that you, you would welcome him in and so you could share life with him. But here's the thing. You ultimately have a decision about what to do with Jesus at your door. And that is a decision that no one else can make for you. And it is a decision that you cannot make for anyone else. It is a personal decision to decide, this is my house. Will Jesus live here? And so today we are on the porch. This is where we begin. And I told you, you've got the most important decision to make here. You know that when people come to your door, you respond differently depending on who it is, right? And so if it is like a longtime friend who's traveling from out of town to come see you, like you know when they're coming, you're looking out your window, you are anticipating their arrival. By the time their car door shuts, your front door is open and you are receiving them with open arms. Come on in, right? But... If you peek out the window and see a door-to-door salesperson selling anything, you're like, turn off the lights, hit the floor, right? Like, we're going to pretend that we're not here. We are not answering the door because we don't want that person in here, right? And, And so it depends on who's at the door. Like, that ultimately determines how you respond. But here's the thing. Even when it is Jesus, the Lord God who loves us and gave his life for us, even when it is him at the door, there are still different ways people respond to him. And so the first thing I'd like to do today is lay out a few of the different ways that people respond to Jesus on the porch. And what I'd like you to do, I want you to write these down, and I want you to ask the question, which of these describes me, okay? I'm not asking you to figure out uh, little bits of each one. 
that describe you. I believe that each person will fit into one of these categories. So I'm asking you to really prayerfully hear from the Spirit, to be honest about which one of these responses describes you, okay? So response number one, some people, when Jesus is knocking at the door, they leave Jesus standing at the door, okay? I mean, there are some people who, when they know that Jesus is pursuing them, they just like double deadbolt lock their door and run away. I don't want them in here. don't want anything to do with them. Now, I am guessing that that probably does not describe many people in this room or with us online, because if you really want nothing to do with Jesus, this is a terrible place to be, right? Like, we like Jesus a lot. Now, for those people, we want to chase after him. We want to show them the beauty and love of Jesus. But my, my guess is that people who leave Jesus standing at the door in this room or with us online are people who think they've already made a decision about him and haven't, okay? People who have sensed God working in their life. They can even point to some things. Man, God did this. He's showing up. He's putting a desire in my heart. Like he's burdening me. I, I feel drawn to him. Like I'm starting to believe in him. Like I know that I need him. And, and there is this, I, there's this sense that like just because I'm thinking about Jesus more, just because I have a fondness for him, I have welcomed him into my life. But it doesn't work like that. There's a moment where you've got to open the door and say, Jesus, you are welcome here. I invite you in. It's like this. So we, we live, uh, my family lives very close to some, uh, some of our, my, my kids' grandparents. So like my dad, my, my wife's parents live very close to us. And so like, my dad comes in and out of our, our lives and our family very frequently. And so there will be times like when we are having him over for dinner. And it is just assumed that when he comes over, he'll just like walk in when we know he's coming. And so there, there are times where I'll hear a knock on the door knowing that it's him. And I'm like, I don't even, I don't even move right? Like I'm, I'm still helping with dinner or getting the table set or playing with the kids or finishing up work or something. And so it's just like, he'll, he'll come in. And then I'll hear another knock and I'll just yell from a couple rooms over, like, just come in. And, and eventually I'll get a call from my dad at my door saying, your door's locked. Can you let me in? <laughs> it's like, well, you, you knew that you were welcome here and I want you here but I've still got to do something to let you in. And I think that sometimes we treat Jesus like that. We're like, well, I love him. I want him to be a part of my life. He knows that I love him. He knows I want him to be a part of my life. And so he'll just come in. But here's the thing. Jesus never opens your door, okay? He waits for you. It's an invitation. He pursues you. He loves you. He'll never stop knocking, but he waits for you to make the decision that you want life with him now and forever. And that requires a moment of decision. And so if you cannot look back on your life and say definitively, like, this is when I welcome Jesus into my life. This is when I said, I believe in you. I love you. I want life with you. If you can't point to that moment, then you, th this is you, that you need that. And in scripture, there are a lot of things that describe this moment of, uh, of what is often called conversion, where you open the door to Jesus through belief and repentance and profession and baptism. And so I'm going to come back to this in just a minute, but for right now, I just want you to know if you fit in the, if this is you, okay? The second way that people respond to Jesus, okay? The first is they leave him standing at the door. The second is that they let Jesus come in, but they want to keep everything the same, all right? So, so they, they, they know Jesus, they believe in him, maybe they've even been baptized, and from there, like, they, they like the idea of life with Jesus, but only on their terms. They want to keep everything the same. I'm mean, going to maintain the same priorities, the same values, the same rhythms to life. I'm going to, still going to treat people the same way. I'm going to do this or that. Like, so nothing changes except they're adding Jesus onto that as if he's like this accessory that can join them in the life they've already established without him. And that doesn't work. It's like this, okay? Before Rachel and I got married, while we were engaged, I moved into the apartment that would eventually be ours several months before our wedding. And so I, she was living elsewhere. I started to set up like kind of like what worked for me. And so my, my clothes took up all the closet. My socks covered all the floor, right? Uh, I had my food in, in the kitchen. So it was a, a beautiful balanced diet of like peanut butter and jelly and mac and cheese and frozen pizza. It was like, it worked for me, right? Now imagine with me, like after, after our wedding and honeymoon, she brings all of her stuff. She moves in and I'm like, man, I'm so excited to live together. But just so you know, nothing's changing. 
That's not going to work, right? That's, that, that's a, because any life that I have established without her is going to be incompatible with her, right? I, I can't just add her into the life that I've ordered. She's a big enough part of my life that everything around that changes. And I think that we treat Jesus, some people treat Jesus like this. We're like, man, I'm just going to bring you in. I'm going to keep everything the same. And the same truth applies to him. Any life you have established without him is going to be incompatible with him. He does not come to fit in, comes to take over as the Lord and God that he is. And so you cannot bring him into your life thinking that he will be there on your terms. Only being present whenever you need him or you want to feel a little bit better about stuff or like you know, life is going tough and, and, and you need a little bit of help. Like you, you bring him in for that, but then whenever he starts messing with stuff and moving stuff around, you just hold his hand and walk him to the door. You're like, that's not for you. Thinking that you can have this in and out relationship with Jesus. You put him on a string and treat him like a yo-yo. And Jesus goes, no, that's not how it works. And my concern is that if people who let Jesus come in are changed by him, then if you are not being changed by him, you may not have let him in. Okay? Especially not in the way that he wants to come in. That's why in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, he says this. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. So I could preach months worth of messages on this one text, but what I really want to focus on is Jesus says, if you come to me and you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. In this context, I want you to think about it like this. If you want me to come into your life, but you want to preserve everything that was without me, you're going to find out that you lose everything. But if you bring me in and are willing to lose the life you established without me in exchange for the life I want to give you, you may lose that life, but you will find life. And so Jesus does not come in as an accessory to your already established life. He does not come in to fit in to what you are already doing. He comes in to be Lord and God of your life because he's Lord and God of the universe. And so we can't treat him like that. The third, third way that we respond is that we lock doors to parts that are off limits, okay? We lock doors to parts that are off limits. I, if I had to guess, this is the one that applies to many of us, including me, okay? So you believe in Jesus. You love him. You want life with him. In fact, you have opened a lot of your life to him and he has done some very good work. You can point to parts of your life that are radically changed. Maybe a, a relationship, a friendship, a marriage. You feel like God has worked in your life in a beautiful way and you were experiencing that. And yet, even so, there is a part or parts of your life that are locked off to him. There are rooms and closets in an attic where you got the lock and it's like, Jesus, you cannot go there. You can go anywhere else, but not there. And you keep them out. And so maybe for you, it is some past hurt that you just hold on to because you feel entitled to bitterness. Maybe for you, it is a way that you view uh, people in the world. Maybe for you, it has something to do with where you place your hope or find your identity there may be a part of your life where you have some hidden sin and you've got that door locked. It's been around for way too long and you're just not letting Jesus into that. Are you with me? And my concern is that so many of us do this. That we just close, close off this part of our life. I'm like, you can't go there, Jesus. And I believe that it's this pattern that results in people whose lives are mostly reflective of Jesus having serious deficiencies where sin runs rampant in one part of their life. They, like, they, they love Jesus, they serve the church, they read scripture, and yet there is sexual sin that is just debilitating them. Jesus, Jesus doesn't get that. I've heard people who, who are living really outwardly beautiful lives say these words, 
I will never practice generosity and give God that much. Door closed. I will not let him into my past. One of the the things that is just like nails on a chalkboard to me is when people will say these words, they will go, that's just who I am in reference to a part of their character or personality that does not align with Jesus. Doesn't resent, you just, you don't have the freedom to say that. What you're doing there is like you're going, this door right here, Jesus, you don't get that. You can have all this, but this is mine. And we think that we can contain sin. The problem is that sin is contagious, okay? And so it moves from room to room. It's like mold. If you see mold forming between your bath or your shower stall and your wall, you're not going to go, oh, we'll see what happens. We'll just, we'll just shut the door when we go in and out. Like that doesn't work because mold moves behind walls and it destroys whatever it touches. So does sin. And so you can't shut a door in your life and go, well, sin's, sin's just okay there. Because it moves. It creeps. And any part of our life that is locked off to Jesus is a place in our life where sin is winning. And Jesus wants better than that for you. He wants to move in and influence every part of your life so that all of it reflects his goodness and his glory. And if you settle for anything less than that, you're missing out. Which leads us to the last response. Okay, so some leave Jesus standing at the door. Others let him in, but try to keep everything the same. Some lock doors to keep him out of parts of our lives. But the hope is that we, through this series, would open up everything to Jesus. That we would open everything up to Jesus. See, when you look, okay, so we just studied the book of Genesis in our Alpha series. Abraham is the example of great faith used often throughout scripture. When Abraham heard the voice of the Lord, he said, everything is yours. Whatever you want. The same response is seen in the first disciples, Matthew chapter four and elsewhere. When Jesus comes and says, hey, come and be fishers of men. He just left everything, career, family, finances, security, identity, whatever. It's all yours. Like, so we, we start to understand that for someone who wants to be a disciple of Jesus, it's full surrender, complete openness. To say, Jesus, my life is open to you. Go wherever you want, do whatever you choose. I trust you. That's the aim of this series. We're going to move from room to room, looking at specific parts of our life. And as we do, we're going to ask, what does Jesus want here? And what do I need to do? Okay? And so in order to prepare us, the whole purpose of this first message is first to, to put you in a position where you are welcoming Jesus into your life so he can do his work. And also to understand what kind of posture you need moving forward so that you are not competing with Jesus or working against him, but rather you are cooperating and working with him. Okay? And so be, uh, to that end, I want to suggest there are three decisions you will need to make throughout this series in, in order for Jesus to do his work in your life, okay? Three decisions, and I just want you to, to write these down, and this, this will guide us through the rest of this series, okay? So the first thing is this. The question is, how, how do we work with Jesus to clean house? And the first thing is, you've got to let Jesus come in, okay? You've got to let Jesus come in. For some of you, you have never been baptized. You don't have a moment in your life where you're like, yes, I opened the door to him. And so my invitation to you is to surrender your life to Jesus through the first act of hospitality called baptism. We don't practice, maybe we practice it a little differently than what you're used to in your faith tradition. We try to practice it like we see in scripture as Jesus was baptized, as every, every person in scripture that committed their life to Jesus was baptized. There are no exceptions to that. And, and so if you have never been baptized, even if you're following him, even if you have another defining moment where you let Jesus in, this is an act of obedience and surrender. For some of you, it'll be the beginning of your relationship with him. And so my hope is that you would say yes to this. Even right now, that you would pick up your phone. If you were with us online, I want you to pick up your phone. We're going to give you a number on the screen. Text baptism to that. And our staff will follow up with you so that we can have a conversation about this open door to Jesus. If you are here in the room, we don't want to wait on this conversation. As soon as the service is over, go back to next steps. And we'll have someone there to talk with you about baptism and maybe even make it happen soon. You got to open the door to Jesus. Let him come in. For those who've already made that decision, Opening your life to Jesus is not a one-time thing, not a one and done. In fact, the life of a disciple 
is one of constant invitation ongoing openness that you are real you're learning and realizing and opening more of your life to him over the years and so if you notice that you've locked something up if you notice that you brought him in but you're not letting him touch anything then you still need to let him in you need to open up so the first thing you've got to do over and over every week you're going to need to let jesus come in when we go into different rooms you're gonna have to say okay jesus you're welcome here i want you to do your work come on the second decision you're gonna have to make is you have to let Jesus define what is good, okay? You have to let Jesus define what is good. So if you are looking to anything other than Jesus to be the authority in your life, then you will find yourself in constant conflict this series. You will find yourself frustrated, and the work of Jesus in your life will be frustrated because he's trying to inform and influence, and you're going, no, but this says this. What about that? And you're going to just find yourself being combative against him. But if Jesus is our authority, if he defines what is good, whenever we enter into a part of our life, a room in our house, then we just go, what do you say? You tell me. So this demands that we acknowledge that we are not in a position to define what is good. I can't be trusted with that. I don't have that good of judgment. I don't have that vast of knowledge. So you and I don't get to define what is good based on what, what feels right, what we enjoy. Culture does not get to define what is good. This is not a majority rule decision where you look around at your peers, your, your five closest friends and say, well, I wonder what they do. I wonder, uh, wonder what they would say is good for my marriage. I wonder what they would say is good for my time and my finances and my work, work life and all of that. Because it's probably not working for them. So why would we want that for us? There's something better I want to be clear here. We do not look to the laws of our land to define what is good. Like that day is past. And that's okay, in my opinion. Because Jesus has a higher standard than anything that this law or that this land would define as good. Jesus says, no, I'm going to raise the bar for my people. I want you to live according to my ways and what I say is good. And so we just understand that we look nowhere else but Jesus to tell us what is good in each room in our life. He's the authority. He's the risen God who's also the creator and sustainer of life. He's the one who loves you so much that he died for you. Don't you think he has your best interest in mind? So when we enter into any room, we don't even need to know what he says uh, in that room before we choose to trust him because we know who he is. And so even before we walk in, we go, whatever he says goes. That's what it means to trust. And so you've got to let Jesus come in. You've got to let Jesus define what is good. And finally, you've got to let Jesus influence how you live. So this series is not about good intentions. And this series is not about kind affections toward Jesus. This series is about gospel-centered action. We say this is who Jesus is. This is what he's done for us. And so I will do what he asks. And so that requires you to let him influence how you live, to let him change some of the decisions that you make. But here's the thing, I promise you that anytime Jesus comes in and starts messing with stuff, anytime he starts rearranging or redecorating, reordering, it is always out of love, not to oppress, but to bless, not to harm, but to help. I promise you that. And if you will take the risk of inviting him into your life, he will do a good work there and you will grow to trust him more. I was talking with a lady from the church um, a couple weeks ago. She was saying that um, recently her sister moved in. And so this lady from the church, uh, she admittedly said, you know, like, I do not enjoy decorating. Like my, you know, ever, ever since I moved into my house, I haven't done really anything to make it look beautiful. And so her sister happens to be an interior designer. And she was a little nervous about how this was going to work. And, and so sure enough, after a couple weeks uh, of, of her sister living there, uh, she came to her and said, hey, um, would, do you mind if I like just kind of did some work in the living room? And so this lady from the church is like, well, yeah, sure, I, you know, do whatever. And she said after, you know, with just a little bit of money and a couple weeks, like her living room was transformed. It looked beautiful. And so if that happens, like why would, why would this, this, this lady go to her sister and be like, okay, that was nice, but I want you to stay out of everything else, right? No way. She's like, hey, can, can we walk into the kitchen now? right? Hey, let's take a walk down the hallway. Tell me your ideas for the bathroom, you know, and, and because this person has proven to be good. 
to know what they're doing. Same is true for Jesus. I promise you, when you invite him into a room, if you let him do his work, you will see what he does there is good. And that will compel you not to say, you gotta stay out of everything else, but to say, come on, can we go to the next? I need you there too. And I need you here too. And by the end, if you walk through this, I promise you, he will put your house in order if you work with him, okay? Because there is a part, this is why we talk about action. This is not us just opening the door and letting Jesus be our maid while we sit back and watch, okay? He intends for you to be involved in cleaning up the mess, involved in putting things back in order, okay? So my kids are all old enough now that when they make a mess, they're involved in cleaning it up. They don't get to spill their milk and just sit back and watch me wipe it, right? That's not how our house goes. And it's the same with Jesus. He goes, I'm, I'm gonna help because there's some things you cannot fix. There's some things you can't clean up, but you gotta be a part of it. You gotta join me in it. In Galatians chapter five, verses 24 and 25, we read, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's our sinful nature in us. We try to put that to death so that we don't keep creating messes while Jesus is cleaning them up. But then it says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's a word that describes dancing or cooperating, working together. And so you, as we're talking about the decisions you make now that will guide you through the series, you gotta let Jesus come in you got, got to let them define what is good, and you have to let Jesus influence how you live. So you work with him, not against him. The incredible beauty of this is that the God of all the universe desires to live with you. I won't just let that sit for a minute. He died and rose from the grave to make that possible, sent his Holy Spirit to be with us and in us. We've got a decision to make. How are we going to respond to Jesus on the porch? Are we going to let him in? Are we going to let him in, but we'll keep control? Are we going to let him in, but lock some stuff up? Or will we just say, Jesus, it's all yours. Come in and do your good work, and I will work with you. The hope is that right now, as we enter into the rest of this series, you would choose to open everything to Jesus. I really want you to grab one of these books. It's going to help you, and I want to leave you with two questions today. Okay? Two questions that will guide your reflection. The first is, how have you responded to Jesus at your door? Okay. So give you four, four possibilities. Which one is you? And don't just write it down, but take time to reflect on it. Why is that true of you? What have you done? And the second question is, what do you need to do to work with him? Okay. So what do you need to do to prepare for the work he's going to do in your life? All right. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe it's an act of obedience. Maybe it's more time in scripture. You choose what do you need to do to work with him, okay? Father God, I pray that your spirit would draw us close to you. I pray that we would live open lives that are ready for you to do your good work. Father, I pray that the enemy would not steal the seeds of the gospel in this moment, that he would not speak lies and deceptions to us to believe that there is a better way than yours. I pray that we would have the faith to open the door wide and say, Jesus, come on in. If there are any among us who have never expressed that commitment, they've never been baptized, they've never surrendered their whole life to him, then Holy Spirit, right now in this moment, beckon them to come, to give you a place in their life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to move into a time of communion. And so where you're at at home, go ahead and pull that out. You can start passing it out. If you're here in the room, you can go ahead and start opening uh, the elements. So this bread and juice represent the body and the blood of Jesus. We take it in remembrance of his death, which pays for our sins, which makes possible life with God. And today, what I want to challenge you to reflect on, as you eat and drink these elements as you bring those into your physical body i want this to be representative of you saying jesus i want you to come into my whole life no doors closed as i eat this and drink this i remember your grace i remember your sacrifice and forgiveness and in response i open my whole life to you take a moment with jesus right now eat and drink and remember